For almost 70 years, the Queen has been the head of the most famous family in the world. But one day, there will be a changing of the guard. Her son, Prince Charles, is waiting in the wings. He's certainly the best trained king we're ever going to have. He's been waiting and training for decades. Since birth, Prince Charles has been preparing for the ultimate role, and with that comes a pressure to choose the perfect bride. He couldn't really step out with a member of the opposite sex without the press immediately analyzing everything about this person. When you marry into the royal family, you marry into pressure. Tonight, royal insiders share the secrets of Charles and Camilla's rise to the top. The ups, the downs, and the scandal. There was such public debate and debate within the hierarchy of the church and the government about whether a divorced man could become king. Not only had a future king divorced, he then married his mistress. The secret love that rocked the royal family. The Camilla affair did huge damage to Prince Charles's standing. They no longer trusted him, and many, many people didn't want him to be the future monarch. But have Charles and Camilla finally won the public's affection? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say a few brief words. It's hard to imagine that when Camilla was the most reviled woman in Britain, that today she is wife of our future king. Once young lovers, now 50 years later, are they ready to rule together? Charles was born very simply to be king. I think he's strong enough and positive enough with Camilla by his side to make a very positive, good king. The story, as will be written in the history books, will be a great love story. In 21st century Britain, appearances from Prince Charles and Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, are a cause of celebration for many. Charles, the longest serving heir apparent in history, and Camilla as his future princess consort, has an integral position in the royal family. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Clarence House, and thank you all very much for coming. But as the royal couple celebrate their 15th wedding anniversary, at the beginning of their relationship, this never seemed like a possibility. Since his birth in 1948, Charles has always been the king in waiting. This was just after World War II, and in terms of the stability of the country and the stability of the monarchy, the birth was seen as a major event. It was a moment for huge celebration because it was the... Charles was born very simply to be king. Just of four siblings and with the future of the monarchy on his shoulders, Charles had to quickly learn the responsibilities of royal life. Charles didn't spend a lot of time with his mother in the early years. She went off on tour and left the children at home with nannies and governesses. He really wanted to do well, everything didn't want to put a foot wrong. And I think that must have been really, really challenging. There's little doubt that his early years and his years at school was a very difficult time for him. He also found that he was a centre of so much attention that he made him realise that in his particular position there would always be fascination in everything he did. As the future king grew older, questions began to be asked of who would one day be his queen. There was acute interest in his private life from the start, really. And of course, that forensic press scrutiny was something that continued through Years. Any woman that happened to be on his arm was already listed as the future wife and a future queen. He does bring a lot of pressure. He was a fit guy, you know, he was very intelligent. The girls seemed to like him, but he was, in a way, weighed down by all of these worries and expectations of what was expected not only of him as heir to the throne, but of his future bride. In the early 70s, Charles would make an introduction that would change the course of royal history. Camilla came from a very high background she had aristocratic links back through her family and she had a very kind of privileged high society upbringing camilla was engaged to andrew parker bowles they were going to get married and then it didn't happen it was a sort of on-off relationship and while it was off camilla sort of befriended charles they clicked immediately there was a chemistry between the two of them and really i think probably charles fell in love with camilla from the moment that he met her in many ways she did tick the right for, for a future consort for the Prince of Wales. 
But did those close to the future king approve? It's fair to say that the senior royals and certainly the important figures in Charles's life, his mother, his father, and the Queen Mother, who Charles was incredibly close to, he always turned to for advice and would certainly have wanted the seal of approval from. They certainly didn't think that she was suitable future royal bride material. She had a past and she romanced Andrew Parker Bowles. Parker Bowles had also gone out with Princess Anne. The heir to the throne nearly always was encouraged to go for a wife who was whiter than white. And it was viewed very much that Camilla did have too much of a colorful past. And as for Camilla, his royal duties took him away from her and overseas. Charles was in his twenties. He was having to do military service because he's one day going to be commander in chief. He then joined the Navy to follow his father, his grandfather and his two great grandfathers. Uh, and it was very important to him uh, to fulfill that role because that's what's expected of him. With Charles away leading the military life expected of a future king, Camilla moved on. Like a lot of young ladies, they don't like their men disappearing out of their lives. He did disappear out of her life and she married Andrew Parker Bowles. One can only imagine that Charles must have felt pretty crushed by this news. He'd gone away to serve, hoping that Camilla would wait for him. Certainly he thought that the relationship had legs, even if his family didn't. By marrying Andrew Parker Bowles, Camilla was ruling herself out of ever having a royal future. If she'd even entertain the thought, of being queen, she would have thought, well, that's it, I'm waving goodbye to that. Because at that point, of course, in the 1970s, there was no way that a divorcee could ever marry a member of the royal family, let alone the heir to the throne. She remained great friends with Prince Charles. Prince Charles was always around at their house. You know, he, he's a godfather to their first child. He was almost one of the family. By the late 70s, eligible bachelor Charles was approaching 30 years old and still without a future queen by his side. He's getting on a bit, isn't it? About time we got married. The media scrutiny grew. He was seen very much as the action man, and a lot of uh, glamorous women were, sort of came and went. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the tabloids began to catch on to the fact that this was a, a bit of a good story. He couldn't really step out with a member of the opposite sex without the press immediately analysing everything about this person. Even though he was very much sought after, that um, in terms of his connection, in terms of that love, his relationship with um, Camilla never left him. One of the women Charles dated was Lady Sarah Spencer. An aristocratic family of earls and dukes dating over 500 years and links to Winston Churchill, the Spencer name was an ideal match for a royal prince. Although the relationship with Sarah didn't last, it resulted in Charles meeting her younger sister, Diana. Shortly after the funeral of uh, Lord Mountbatten, he'd been assassinated. Charles had been very, very upset. And um, Diana said to Charles, I, I saw you at that funeral and you looked so terribly sad. And he was very touched by this. And there was a beautiful young girl showing him attention. And clearly he, he felt a lot of responsibility too, to fulfill what was necessary as the heir to the throne and get married. Where Camilla had been deemed unsuitable as a future queen, Diana was the proposed at Windsor Castle. He was given more as an ultimatum by his father to either marry uh, Diana um, or let her go. Diana ticked all the boxes. She didn't have any baggage. She hadn't had any relationships really before meeting Prince Charles. He thought she was the kind of girl he could grow to love. Despite the shortness of their courtship, the palace, press and the public were enamoured by the royal couple. Why have you come here today? To try and get a glimpse of Diana and Charles. Why, why are you so pleased? Because I think she's just the right person for him. This was an extraordinarily quick whirlwind, but it's what the public wanted. Once they saw Diana, they wanted Diana to be Prince Charles' wife. They were about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would, in all likelihood, be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to it, Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> Shockingly, they'd only met a dozen times before they married. They didn't know each other at all. And I suppose in love. Of course. 
<laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Most of the world thought they were looking at the future king and queen of Britain. Everybody likes to think when they get married that they're going to be married for life. It's a fairy tale. I saw for myself, they were in love with each other at the beginning, but somewhere along the line, it collapsed. On a hot summer's day, with the eyes of the world upon them, Prince Charles married Lady Diana Spencer in July 1981. The event was watched by 750 million people worldwide. This was a thing of fairy tales. She was so young, so beautiful. Here he was, the future king. It seemed to be, from the outside looking in, a marriage made in heaven. The feeling was electric from one end of the United Kingdom to the other, from north to south, from east to west. The United Kingdom was granted a national holiday to mark the wedding of the heir to the British throne, who was marrying somebody many thought to be the perfect future queen. They bought the tea towels, they bought the mugs, they turned up outside St Paul's Cathedral, they lined the streets of the Mall. They gathered outside that famous balcony to watch that iconic royal kiss. When the truth was somewhat different. Behind closed doors, Marries into the royal family. When you're born into the royal family, you grow up with that pressure. When you marry into the royal family, you marry into pressure. Diana told me much later in one of our private conversations that she had felt like a lamb to the slaughter as she walked up the aisle, which is very sad, but I think she knew that things weren't quite right. And when she saw Camilla um, in the congregation, was immediately uneasy about it. Most were unaware that Charles and Camilla had remained in close contact. Charles was so close to Camilla that he bought her a bracelet that was engraved with their initials, which Diana found. She was enraged by it. She knew who it was for, and she wanted to know why he was giving this, this token to Camilla. Camilla's presence was even felt on the couple's two-week honeymoon, when Charles was spotted wearing a set of personalised cufflinks. Almost unbelievably, Charles wore cufflinks, the C and C, meaning Charles and Camilla. They didn't have anything in common. They didn't seem to be able to talk to each other. Despite whispers in the press of a rift between the royal couple, within three years, Charles and Diana had welcomed two sons, William and Harry, into the world. Royal insiders pinpoint this as the moment that Charles and Diana's relationship was starting to break down. Charles wasn't the fully hands-on dad that she would have expected. And I suppose that created a distance between the two. She strongly suspected that Charles was still in love with Camilla and hadn't let go of her. Diana felt cut off, she felt isolated, she felt betrayed. Royal tours gave the press a first-hand look at the cracks in the marriage. Diana had asked Charles to, to come with her to the Taj Mahal, the temple of love. And he'd refused, and she was really hurt by that. So she made a point of going on her own. A tour of South Korea in 1992 would prove to be their last overseas engagement as a royal couple. All attention from the British press was focused on any mutual signs of affection being shown between the prince and the princess. They went separately and they left separately, and I think the, the press really jumped on that and they realised that this was going seriously wrong. But nobody apart from Diana and her, her intimate circle knew about Camilla at that time. That didn't come until later. Shortly after their return from South Korea, in the year that the Queen dubbed an Annas Horribilis, Charles and Diana's separation was formally announced by Prime Minister John Major in the House of Commons. To separate. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, though saddened, understand and sympathise with the difficulties that have led to this decision. Charles and Diana were told to continue to carry out royal engagements separately. Diana remained living in Kensington Palace, whilst she also kept her title Princess of Wales. Their Royal Highnesses have no plans to divorce, and their constitutional positions are unaffected. 
At that stage, bizarrely, they said it doesn't change anything that she'd still destined to be the Queen, which was a bizarre thing to say when you look back at it now. Despite them no longer being a couple, divorce wasn't an option for the heir to the throne. Charles, as the heir to the throne, is the future head of the Church of England. The thought that someone that was, who was going to be head of the Church of England could ever be divorced was complete no-no. The heartbroken public were unaware of the reason behind the separation of their future king and his queen. What do you think of the news today that she's going to live separately from Prince Charles? No, that's the first time I've heard that. First time I've heard that. At that point, there were whispers within the palace, within the press, but nobody really had the full story. But within months of Charles and Diana going their separate ways, leaked phone calls seemed to publicly confirm Camilla's relationship with the future monarch. Tabloid newspaper had somehow managed to get access to conversations between the future king and his lover, Camilla Parker Bowles, which were at best described as intimate, although I'm sure the Queen probably had other choice words for the conversations that were leaked. This, after all, is the future king, someone the nation needs to look up to, to have the utmost respect for. And here he is on tape, speaking to his lover, telling her that he wishes he could be a tum The revelations proved devastating for Prince Charles, whose press image had been at an all-time high just a decade earlier. Prince Charles was in Shetland today, doing his best to look as if personal problems were the last thing on his mind, and he avoided all questions about the Camillagate tapes. The Charles Camillagate was catastrophic, and it was it was the beginning of of the public's absolute hatred of Camilla and his plummeted as well. People thought he was ridiculous, they thought he was cruel, they thought they, they deemed them both to be incredibly cruel to have done this to Diana. The leaked tapes were the beginning of a public feud between Charles and Diana, later dubbed the War of the Waleses. Charles and Diana fought each other using friends in the press. This was open warfare. In a rare television interview appearance, Prince Charles sat down with broad... Mrs. Parker Bowles is a great friend of mine. I have a large number of friends. I'm terribly lucky to have so many friends who I think are wonderful and uh, make the whole difference to my life, which would become intolerable otherwise. And she has been a friend for a very long time. During the unprecedented documentary, Prince Charles publicly confirmed for the first time that he'd been unfaithful to Diana. Dickie Arbiter was Prince Charles's press secretary at the time. And I warned them at the time, it would have to be warts and all. You cannot deny anything, you cannot leave anything out, uh, and nothing was left out, because Jonathan Dimbleby asked the Prince of Wales about extramarital relationship. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. He admitted that he had been unfaithful, although he said not until his own marriage had irretrievably broken down, both of us having tried. But that was the headline, Charles admits adultery. To go from a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, such and such member of the royal family has got mistresses on the side or, you know, is having affairs, was quite different to actually hearing from the future monarch, I have been unfaithful to my wife and my wife is Diana, one of the most popular women on the planet. He was very upset with the negative press, as anybody would be, and, and, and it was it was very negative. It was very it was very vicious. Less than a year later, Diana, still with her Princess of Wales title, retaliated with a revelatory BBC Panorama interview with Martin Bashir. It was an absolute secret. No one knew about this. A very few people within the BBC knew it was happening. I certainly didn't know as the BBC's royal correspondent until 24 hours before it was going to go out. In the hour-long interview, Diana laid bare details of her marriage, as well as confirming that Charles had been having an affair with Camilla. Your husband renewed his relationship with Mrs Camilla Parker Bowles. Were you aware of that? Yes, I was. But I wasn't in a position to do anything about it. A husband who was having a relationship with somebody else? Was a husband who loved someone else, yes. 
You really thought that? Mm -hmm. I didn't think that, I knew it. There were some terrifically damaging assertions in there. I think the more damaging in the eyes of the palace was that she questioned Prince Charles's desire and ability to be king. Do you think Mrs. Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit... After the Panorama interview, and she was very contrite, she was very sorry that she had done it, but why had she done it in the first place? It was all this sort of attacking each other, get, getting back at each other. The scandal rocked the royal family. This is not what the monarchy is supposed to be about, and it had become a complete soap opera. The Camilla affair did huge damage to Prince Charles's standing amongst his people, amongst his subjects, the British public. They felt that he had acted disgracefully towards Diana. They no longer trusted him. And many, many people didn't want him to be the future monarch. In the midst of the public chaos, Camilla's marriage to Andrew Parker Bowles also came to an end. Up until that point, Andrew was more than happy to let Charles and Camilla's affair go on, providing it was in private. As soon as it came out into the public and he was presented as this injured party, he couldn't let it go on and the couple filed for divorce. Could Charles's reputation ever recover? Had his affair with Camilla ended all hope of them ever being together? By this stage, of course, there was no prospect of her realistically, as it was seen at that time, of ever becoming Charles' his wife. Charles became very well aware that if he was ever going to regain those things, respect, trust, authority, leadership, it was going to be a slow road back to recovery. Charles and Camilla's affair had been explosive for the monarchy. Prince Charles in Shetland today and he avoided all questions about the Camilla Gate tapes. The popularity of the future king was at an all-time low with the public, as was Camilla's. So at this point in the kind of mid-90s, Camilla was, her reputation was absolutely traduced. She was a marriage wrecker, she was a temptress, she looked like a horse. People would spit at her in the streets. Her public reputation that she was a complete evil witch and she had seduced Prince Charles from his gorgeous wife. She was, I think it's fair to say, um, the most hated woman in Britain at one point. Charles's relationship with Diana had also sunk to a new low. Things just got so toxic, and they really were toxic between Charles and Diana. They couldn't even be in the same room as each other. And I think it was having a really bad effect on, on, on William and Harry. The marriage problems of Charles and Diana have cast a shadow over the royal family. Now the Queen has decided to bring the whole issue to a head by advising them to divorce. There's no doubt at all that as Supreme Governor of the Church of England, the Queen certainly did not welcome the prospect of divorce. But since there was such enmity between the couple, there was absolutely no choice. HRH the Prince of Wales versus HRH the Princess of Wales. This was unprecedented. Of course, Charles, as a future king, is going to be the head of the Church of England. The Church of England does not condone divorce. So this was damaging for the royal family. With all these revelations, with all the press speculation and coverage of a bitter divorce between the couple, no one would ever think of Prince Charles as the next king. He was widely considered unfit to be the next monarch of Great Britain. Charles's position as the future king looked precarious, and his relationship with Camilla was damaging his standing within his own family. He had been so determined to stay by Camilla, to keep her in his life, that he'd alienated not just the public, but many members of his own family too. The Queen did not want the pair of them to be together. She had said time and time again she wanted the relationship to be over. During this difficult time, there was only one person he could turn to and truly confide in. Well, Camilla was absolutely reviled in, in England, um, hated by a lot of people. Um, to Charles, she was his absolute pillar of strength. You know, she was his rock and really she was everything to him. Charles was determined to continue his relationship with Camilla and one day make her his future queen. Anyone close to the Prince of Wales, and that included his mother, knew that when it came to Camilla, she was non-negotiable, and Charles made that very clear from the outset. He hadn't gone through everything he'd been through, the public humiliation, the admitting of adultery, and not to be with Camilla at the very end of it all. When Camilla was 
divorced and Charles was divorced, it kind of opened up the possibility of the two of them getting together, but both of them being very sensible people and grown up, uh, realized that this would not be a walk in the park. They would have to do it very gently to ease Camilla into society. If Charles was to keep his throne and one day end up with the woman he loved, he would have to improve his public image and regain their respect. Charles went into damage limitation and firefighting on a level that, frankly, the palace were probably not equipped to do. Charles employed Mark Bolland, a very seasoned and experienced PR professional, to rehabilitate his and Camilla's image. One of the ways he did that was he absolutely befriended all the newspaper editors, he befriended all the newspaper owners, and he gave those editors stories, favourable stories, about Charles, about Camilla. And he would feed us little bits of information. He would tell us what Camilla was up to, what Charles was up to, what his feelings were about Camilla. Then Prince Charles and his sons, on their first day together on holiday, appeared, having deliberately, and most unusually, encouraged the press and television coverage. He was beginning to lay the groundwork for the woman who he wanted to one day be his queen. But in 1997, tragedy struck. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. I think that Charles was devastated when Diana died. I think he was wrapped with guilt. I think also he wanted, as the Queen did, to protect William and Harry. But the monarchy tends to work using precedent. There was absolutely no precedent for the outpouring of grief, which was completely unique when Diana died. But there's no question that Charles attempts to get the public on side with Camilla were obviously set back. In the face of this national tragedy, it looked like the British public would never accept Camilla as part of the royal family. I think that after Dinah's death, I mean, Camilla was abused in the street, was yelled at, she had nasty letters written to her. It was really, really difficult for her. The size of the challenge that was facing Charles and Camilla was immense and many, many people thought it was impossible. People thought if they wanted to be together, they would have to be together abroad, that it could never, ever happen within the United Kingdom. A year after Diana's death, Charles restarted his campaign to introduce Camilla as the woman who would one day stand beside him. But he was met with strong opposition. The Queen was quite clear that she was not going to meet Camilla. She didn't want to hear about Camilla. Um, and it was still a name that really wasn't widely spoken in palace corridors. She, as constitutional monarch, uh, felt she should uphold the standards that she'd adhered to all her life. And should she accept that her divorced son should be with a divorced woman? Um, should she condone this relationship? Was that what her faith, her religion, she's very religious. Uh, would, would guide her to do. The Queen may have been having doubts, but on Charles's staff, it was decided that they needed to forge ahead with introducing Camilla to the great British public and bring her out into the open as Charles's partner. There was an attempt to do it at the wedding of Santa Palmer Tomkinson, and her mum, Patty, was Camilla's best friend. So they were going to try and be together there, but that couldn't happen either because they, they decided they would, they would upstage the bride and that wasn't fair. There had been suggestions that the Prince and Camilla Parker Bowles would take the opportunity to go public with their relationship. But she joined other guests well before him, looking relaxed and... The couple were invited to the birthday party of Camilla's sister Annabelle to be held at the Ritz Hotel in London. It was seen as the right opportunity to give the British public their first glimpse of Charles with his future consort Camilla by his side. It was dubbed Operation Ritz. I remember being in the room and it was a cold day in January and rumours started to knock about that something was going to happen down at the Ritz and that maybe we were going to get sight of Charles and Camilla together for the first time. Mark Boland was giving sort of the nod and the wink that actually we ought to get our ladders down there. So I said to the news desk, right, get the ladder down there. Well, there were 200 cameras there, I think. Charles and Camilla emerged. She
wearing a very neat little black coat. And I remember she had a beautiful choker on at the time. And, and they stood and they posed for photographs. And those photographs went around the world. And that was the beginning of, of trying to get the public to like them. Of course, it's only a picture, but last night's coming out was symbolic. Whatever people think about Camilla and Charles, they're telling the world we're a couple and you better accept it. This was a big statement. Camilla was going to have some sort of formal role in the future because there she was on the arm of Prince Charles, very officially his date for the evening. This really felt like a turn in the road. Suddenly, Camilla wasn't just Charles's mistress. Now she was his companion. Now the press had their first picture of them, it was down to the Queen to give the relationship the seal of approval. In 2000, she agreed to attend a birthday party for King Constantine of Greece, to be held at Charles's home, Highgrove. So on the guest list was Camilla. It seems Camilla's friendship with King Constantine of Greece, seen here at his daughter's wedding, was crucial to her inclusion on the guest list for his 60th birthday party today. The Queen, it seems, made a very deliberate decision to attend. As the press officers in the royal family are very frequently reminding me that, Emily, private things remain private. Sometimes private things do not remain private when they want to send a message. And at that particular point, they wanted to show, or at least Charles wanted to show, Miller had got the ultimate seal of approval from his mother, the head of state, the Queen. The Queen knew that if she met Camilla in a formal or semi-formal capacity, it would be a really, really big deal. Buckingham Palace are playing down the importance of today's meeting, but for Charles and Camilla, it is a milestone. The heir to the throne's long-term companion now accepted in royal circles. The Queen, of course, would have preferred Charles not to have divorced. She would have preferred him to have admitted adultery or not to have committed adultery. But she is quite a prat. wasn't going to go anywhere. And I think, think the Queen then thought, well, we might as well get on with this and she might as well be welcomed into the family. The meeting with the Queen was absolutely um, fundamental in, in the turning point of, of the public accepting Camilla because the feeling was, certainly among Charles and his advisers, that if the Queen could accept Camilla and could welcome her into the then the public could welcome Camilla too. And that really paved the way for um, a change in attitude among the public. By the end of the millennium, Charles's popularity had bounced back. But there was still a long way to go for Camilla to be accepted as Charles's future queen. As king in waiting, Charles will not only inherit the throne one day, but also become supreme governor of the Church of England. This posed a problem for Charles and Camilla's relationship. By now, they were officially living with each other at Clarence House and Highgrove. But was Camilla's status as common law wife appropriate for a future king and head of the church? Marriage would make the relationship far more appropriate. I think there was pressure from the outside that really he had to make this official. As his position, he's going to be head of the Church of England, defender of all faiths as he, as he wants it to be when he becomes king. And frankly, I think from his kind of point of view as future king. I think it, it needed to happen. But there was a problem. The Church of England did not approve of divorcees remarrying. The Prince of Wales was starting to persuade very senior figures, people like the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Kerry, that you know there was a reason for him to be married. Why should the heir to the throne, who would one day be uh, the king, the defender of the faith, why should he be forced to be in the situation where he can't marry the woman he loves? Why is it for them to be partners. And so I think people gradually came around to the feeling that it was just the right thing to do. Possibly one of the last to be persuaded was Her Majesty the Queen, a very high church believer in, in, in the marital state. But once the church was on side, I think there was no real reason to block it anymore. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. In February 2005, 56-year-old Charles and 58-year-old Camilla announced their engagement. How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, all right. Just all right. I'm just, like, I'm just coming down to work. Did you get down on one knee to propose? <laughs> the future bride wore a ring that belonged to Charles's beloved grandmother, the Queen Mother. I think Charles had always wanted to make Camilla his bride, his wife. I think he felt that she had she'd endured a lot of real 
to make her his wife, his bride. This was the first time in history that an heir to the throne would marry a divorcee. The Church of England might have backed the union, but this wedding would have to be very different to all previous royal weddings. Charles and Camilla would need to have a much lower key ceremony. Having been divorced already, both Charles and Camilla would have found it difficult to marry within the church. So instead, they had a civil service at the Windsor Guild Hall. This would be the first large scale event with Camilla at the center of royal life. And Camilla was nervous at the potential public reaction. She was terrified no one would come. She was terrified she'd be booed. And I remember seeing film footage at the time, about 6 a.m., and there was no one on the streets of Windsor. It was freezing as well, I remember. It was a really, really cold day. She must have been terrified that no one would be there. And, you know, I, I think as a journalist, I was looking at it thinking the only reaction to this is going to be national apathy, which is kind of almost as bad as, as protests. However, by 10.30, the streets were thronging with people. As the prince and his bride were being driven the short distance from Windsor Castle to the Guildhall this morning, history prepared to record a royal marriage without precedence. TV cameras filmed the moment when Charles and Camilla arrived at the registry office in Windsor for their historic marriage. The ceremony was attended by William, Harry, Camilla's children and a few friends. The Queen, as head of the Church of England, did not feel that she could attend. But she did join the couple for a blessing at St George's Chapel afterwards. The first time the, the public got to see the Queen really close to Camilla was when Charles and Camilla came out of St George's Chapel after the blessing of their wedding ceremony. And there was um, a picture that didn't appear to be staged. It seemed very, very natural, but there was Camilla by the Queen's side, the Queen looking very happy, very relaxed, and, well, Charles looking like the happiest man on earth, because I think on that day he probably was. And she looked gorgeous. I mean, she looked fantastic um, in the outfit with that beautiful dress and the headdress, and I thought that she looked the best, you know, she'd ever looked, really. And I think people really at that time thought, well, why shouldn't these two, who were the picture of happiness, who had, had this long, long love affair on and off over many years. Why shouldn't they find happiness? Camilla was now officially part of the royal family. The palace announced that she would be called Princess Consort when Charles becomes king. The Queen also gave her a title of Duchess of Cornwall, which is actually her secondary title. Legally, she is Princess of Wales. But Camilla knew how fond of Diana the public had been. It wasn't going to wash with them that she would be the next Princess of Wales. I remember when they got married, it was eight years after the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, and feelings and memories were still running high. So she's used the other title, uh, Duchess of Cornwall. She's quite comfortable with it. Titles do not matter to Camilla. She doesn't really care one iota what she's called, um, as long as she's not called anything rude. The wedding drew a line under Charles and Camilla's past once and for all and allowed the world to look to the future of the monarchy. For all the spin doctors and PR that had gone on for years behind the scenes, the thing that really transformed Camilla's public image was the royal wedding, because that was her becoming a member of the royal family. And therefore, she was no longer an outsider. She was the Duchess of Cornwall. She was, she is, a future queen. So the marriage changed everything. Who would have thought that 10 years before, the woman who had been vilified by the British press, Camilla Parker Bowles, was a potential future queen consort? Now that Camilla was officially part of the royal family, the British public could see what sort of future consort she would be. Of course, once she had married into the royal family, she became Charles's consort. She was there with him on royal engagements. She accompanied him on some royal tours and actually Camilla proved to be incredibly popular. She did her own PR. She didn't need a spin doctor. She did what she does best. She engages with people. She has a good relationship with the, with the press pack. She doesn't upstage the Prince of Wales in any way. They are a great team. We have to remember that she didn't have a job. She left school with one O-level and she didn't have a career. She wasn't a career woman. And at the age of about 60, she 
had to learn how to work very hard because Prince Charles um, does about 502 uh, engagements a year. He keeps going all the time. He works every day, including Christmas and Easter. As Charles's future consort, she has also thought very hard about the charities that she supports. All senior members of the royal family have their favourite charities, the charities they support, the issues that they're most passionate about. In this case, it was very difficult for her because so many causes that we understand she actually did care about were associated with Diana. And she had to be so careful not to tread on Diana's image and Diana's favourite subjects or favourite charities because, of course, it would look like she was trying to walk in... She's very committed to, to, to quite a number of charities, one of them the Osteoporosis Society, because her mother died of osteoporosis. Another is, is learning, book reading, uh, education, and abuse against women. She's very committed to that as well. Now, the purpose of asking you all here today is to try and form a united front to help victims of rape and sexual abuse. I think Camilla is clearly very passionate about the domestic abuse agenda and about making sure that what influence she has, that she has this platform given to her as a senior member of the royal family, that she's not going to waste it and she's not going to throw it away. And I think a lot of people will admire her for that. As the wife of the heir to the throne, Camilla's image has radically changed. We saw a bit of a, a, a makeover ahead of the royal wedding. She she lightened her hair. Has, has she clearly had a lot of work done on her skin? She was radiant. She stopped smoking, and you know all of these things to to please Charles. And her sense of style changed too. Now we were seeing her in far more regal attire. You know, experimenting with beautiful dress codes. She's a great lover of hats. She really wears hats well. We saw her coming out in, in jewelry from the royal collection. So really emerging um, as a royal. As uh, Duchess of Cornwall, she suddenly began to scrub up pretty well. <laughs> and um, she wore some beautiful clothes. And she's adopted a style which she, she wears quite pale clothes, which suits her as she goes older. Um, and she's very smart. I dare say behind doors, she probably actually still puts on a pair of, of wellies and some smelly old jeans and really enjoys dressing down, but she also dresses up very well indeed now. Over the past two decades, Camilla's relationship with the Queen has also transformed. Of course, it was a slow burn, and I think that they obviously had to build their relationship. They had to develop that. They have a shared love of horses. And they're both uh, outdoorsy. They're both country ladies. It's interesting that when you... Camilla with the royal family. She she seems very much at the heart of it. When you see her with the Queen, and they're always giggling, the pair of them, uh, they seem to have a lot in common. And, and it's just interesting how we've gone from the Queen not wanting her, even as back as 1970, she didn't want her because she was a bit of a girl. And it's precisely because of that now, because she's a bit of a girl, because she's good fun, that the Queen wants her around. At the Queen's Diamond Duke, the country celebrated 60 years of the Queen's reign. But it was also an opportunity to clearly show where Camilla was in the royal family's pecking order. When the Queen decided to put paying, this is Charles's wife, she'll one day take my place, and she is the future of the British royal family. And that marked such a turning point from the woman who'd had bread rolls pelted at her in the supermarket as the wicked mistress of you know, of, of the heir to the throne. Of course, it's a terrible cliche to say that a picture paints a thousand words, but that image tells you that Camilla has come in from the cold. That was a very, very big moment for Camilla. By the time of her wedding to Prince Charles in 2005, Camilla Parker Bowles's journey from royal mistress to royal wife had been extraordinary. Labelled a marriage breaker by the press and reviled in public, she had fought hard to win her place next to Prince Charles. Whatever people think about Camilla and Charles, they're telling the world we're a couple. Despite her place in the nation's affections and the approval of the Queen, she still had to convince the hardest judges of all. The rest of the royal family, and in particular, Princes William and Harry. Camilla's relationship with William and Harry has always been quite...
a Diana obviously painted Camilla as the marriage wrecker. For the Prince of Wales, the first proper meeting between his son William and his longtime friend Camilla Parker Bowles was obviously a significant event. The princes were in their mid teens when their father's relationship with Camilla became public. Harry refused to see her to start with. Harry wears his heart on his sleeve. He was in his teenage rebellious phase, smoking dope and kind of getting into trouble. But with children of her own, Camilla was well placed to tackle the unique challenges of being stepmother to William and Harry. In the early years after Diana's death, all those boys had was Charles. And we all know Charles was emotionally stunted. So they would have needed a woman to talk to sometimes. And I suspect Camilla was very good at fulfilling that role. William first spent half an hour with Camilla. It's now emerged and they've got together again since. She knows that she's not their mother. She's never tried to step in and be their mother. She has been there to support them when they've needed that support. So what was in the early stages a very difficult relationship has grown to become a very close one. It is amazing how close we've, we've become, you know, I mean, ever since our mother died. She's a wonderful woman and she's made our father very, very happy, which is the most important thing. William and I love her to bits. Ten years before Camilla married Charles, it was inconceivable that William and Harry would have accepted her into their family. But both princes would themselves bring new people into the royal fold, Kate and Meghan. As a royal outsider herself, Camilla had great empathy for both young women. For Kate in particular... Kate didn't know how to be royal, so she would have felt like an outsider. And in those early days, she was pursued. She was pursued by the paparazzi, by the press. The new bride has experienced it at first hand. She, not William, will be the focus of attention. While Camilla, she knew how it worked. And she was in a very good position to give Kate advice. In the to the royal wedding, she took Kate for lunch, I think, just to sort of settle nerves and, and give some good stepmotherly advice. She has been there for the Duchess of Cambridge. Just over six years after William and Kate's wedding, Prince Harry announced his engagement to Meghan Markle. Royal Watch has talked of her as someone quite unlike the other members of the family. But she had much in common with her future husband's stepmother. In many ways, Camilla had paved for Meghan, in the sense that they were both divorcees, neither of them were royal, but I think Meghan took any criticism um, of her position personally. Um, Camilla would have been there to tell her not to take it personally, and that this is just what happens when you're an outsider. Throughout her life with Charles, Camilla has always maintained an upbeat public persona in the face of criticism. It's a quality that has rubbed off on Charles. As he edges closer to the throne, Camilla has tried Form the way he engages with the public and approaches his duties. I think it's very clear when you look at Charles and Camilla over the last 15 years what a difference she has made to his persona, to his outlook, to his demeanour. <laughs> <laughs> He's just clearly a much happier person now. <laughs> He's relaxed a bit. <laughs> In 2017, on a trip to Canada, Charles and Camilla visited native communities. <laughs> One of the things laid on was this Inuit couple who were um, throat singing. <laughs> And it sounded very much like two people having sex. <laughs> Charles and Camilla were tickled pink by this. They were giggling like a couple of teenagers. And that would never have happened 20 years ago. Charles was a very serious, not a very humorous man. She lights up his life. She understands his moods. She understands how to get him out of those moods. She knows what makes him laugh. He loved that, that, that she was fun. Camilla has played a large part in softening Charles's public image during his long march to the throne. The awkward young man who blushed before the cameras. How do you feel today, both of you? A confident public figure through the influence of his second wife. I think that Prince Charles would say that Camilla had been the making of him. I think she would be very modest about it and say absolutely not at all. But there may be one area of Charles's public activity which Camilla is powerless to change. His now infamous so-called political meddling. The results of human activity warm even this.
remote ocean. He has been outspoken on many issues in the past, and some of which have landed him in hot water. In 1984, at a prize-giving dinner for the Royal Institute of British Architects, Charles denounced a proposed extension to the National Gallery. But what is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. Ever since, Charles has been accused of voicing opinions on areas of British life that some claim he has no right to be involved in. Patients should be able to gain the benefit of the best of both worlds, complementary and orthodox. In 2015, The Guardian newspaper revealed letters written by Charles to cabinet members over policy issues close to his heart. We know he cares about the environment and architecture, genetic engineering, all these things uh, that mean a lot to him. And he's not afraid of uh, controversy. The environment is full of uncertainty. We have made it into a rubbish dump. But he's writing the sort of letters with questions that you and I might ask. We won't get the answer, but he'll get the answer. As Prince of Wales, Charles's outspokenness has been tolerated. But when he takes the throne as Charles III, will it continue? The monarch is not supposed to get involved with politics. It will be interesting to see how Charles handles this, because he's not used to, to taking a step back. I think we will see him being proactive and possibly even political, um, with a small p. But I think it does give us an indication that, that Charles is going to be a hands-on king. But, you know, the monarchy changes all the time. Maybe he will be allowed to do that if he ever gets to be king. As Charles stands poised to become king, Britain is braced for a different, more political kind of monarchy. But the question remains, when will he take the throne? And when his 71-year wait ends, will Camilla take the title of queen? <laughs> Prince Charles is the longest serving heir to the British throne in history. In 2020, at the age of 71, his wait to become king continues. Yet with Prince Philip, the Queen's greatest support, the centre of royal power for Charles to fill. Prince Charles has stepped in where Prince Philip would have been. Uh, he now joins the Queen for the Royal State Opening of Parliament. It's been suggested that Charles would be the next head of the Commonwealth. This is an occasion to celebrate with renewed pride a remarkable Commonwealth family. It makes sense because it provides the continuity and stability of this 53-nation club. He's been the official mourner-in-chief when it comes to attending state funerals. I think what we're seeing is a gradual handover of power. There is talk of him being more Shadow King than Prince of Wales. After so long on the sidelines, Charles is now on the cusp of stepping onto the British throne, with Camilla firmly by his side. But what kind of leadership style will we see under Charles? I think he's strong enough and positive enough with Camilla by his side to make a very positive, good king for our times, whatever kind of times we have. Because of Brexit, because of divisions within the country, Prince Charles is going to have to heal a divided nation and try to make it a united nation. After contracting coronavirus in March 2020, Charles gave a message to the nation, offering solidarity with others affected by the greatest health crisis in a generation. It hinted at what we may see when as king he is called upon to speak in times of crisis. None of us can say when this will end, but end it will. Until it does, let us try and live with hope and with faith in ourselves and each other, look forward to better times to come. Only two days after this message, Charles opened the fast-tracked Nightingale Hospital, specially built in London's Excel Centre to cope with coronavirus patients. In this dark time, this place will be a shining light. Alongside the Queen's historic address to the nation during the pandemic, Charles's message demonstrated the power of the monarchy to unite in troubled times. As the Queen ages into her 90s, we may see Charles speaking directly to the nation more and more. It has led to speculation that she could hand the throne to him early, effectively abdicating. Abdication 
still quite a dirty word in royal circles. I don't think she will contemplate abdication unless forced to do so by ill health. The Royal Navy's greatest battleship had been chosen for the voyage to the Cape. When the Queen famously made her address to the nation in South Africa in her 20s, she swore she would be Queen for the rest of her life. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long of our great imperial family to which we all belong. The vows that she made on her 21st birthday to serve until she takes her last breath, I think those vows are as true to her now as they were then. The last time a monarch abdicated was in 1936, when Edward VIII stepped down so he could marry American socialite Wallace Simpson. As a divorcee, the morality of that era made her an unacceptable bride for the king. But 60 years later, Britain was more accommodating of Charles and Camilla, both divorced from previous marriages. Abdication may not be palatable to the palace or the public, but further back in royal history is an example of another way that power could be handed over to Charles. In 1811, as George III became incapacitated with mental illness, Parliament invoked the Regency Act, whereby his son could rule in his name as the Prince Regent. The Regency Act remains at the disposal of any reigning monarch. The Regency Act means that she still retains the title but uh, the next in line, i.e. Prince Charles, will do all the duties for her. I don't believe for a moment that there will be a Regency Act invoked unless there is a serious illness that prevents the Queen from carrying out her duties. There are no signs of that. However it may happen, the rule of Charles III edges ever closer, with Camilla destined to be by the King's side. 20 years ago, it was inconceivable that the British public would have tolerated her in this position. But today, it seems she will be welcomed warmly into the role. But will there be support for her taking the title of Queen, even though Clarence House stated she would be Princess Consort at the time of their engagement? I think after everything that she's been through, all the vile press that she had to put up with, the names, the backstabbing. I think he will want her to be Queen Camilla. There will be some sort of testing the water. There will be focus groups and um, polling being done to find out if that is acceptable to the British public. I mean, what a rehabilitation. She was the most hated woman in Britain. She had, you know, tempted him away from his perfect wife and children, and they were having this affair, and it caused this divorce and the scandal of the 90s to then be crowned as Queen Camilla is absolutely extraordinary. Whether she is called Queen or not, Camilla will be the closest confidant and support for our next king. But who else will be included in Charles's monarchy? They have already been signed. Very clear for quite some years that he wants to streamline the monarchy and he doesn't want too many members of the family to charge the British taxpayer more than they have to. Although this is, might be a good thing for the taxpayer and a good thing for the way the royal family work, it's not such a good thing for the charities because you can't stay involved with all these charities with so few people. With the high-profile departures of Harry and Meghan, followed by Prince Andrew's dramatic exit from official duties, Charles's push for a smaller monarchy is already becoming a reality. We are now at a point where we are almost on a skeletal royal family. It's gone beyond streamlined. We've got the Queen, we've got the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. We have the Cambridges and, of course, Princess Anne. Whatever form Charles's inner circle takes, Camilla will be beside him, as she has been for 20 years. Their journey as a couple together has not always been smooth. But it seems for now, destined for a happy ending. The story, as will be written in the history books, will be a great love story, and it will be uh, not only a king in waiting who had to wait 50 years to get on the throne, but also a prince who had to wait decades and decades to get the woman he'd always been in love with by his side.
recently. They'd only met a dozen times before they married. They didn't know each other at all. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Most of the world thought they were looking at the future king and queen of Britain. Everybody likes to think when they get married that they're going to be married for life. It's a fairy tale. I saw for myself, they were in love with each other at the beginning, but somewhere along the line, it collapsed. On a hot summer's day, with the eyes of the world upon them, Prince Charles married Lady Diana Spencer in July 1981. The event was watched by 750 million people worldwide. This was a thing of fairy tales. She was so young, so beautiful. Here he was, the future king. It seemed to be, from the outside looking in, a marriage made in heaven. The feeling was electric from one end of the United Kingdom to the other. From